We're gonna look at games where white, where white, where black gets uh, double pawns in the opening, namely doubled C pawns, or as Spencer calls them double B pawns. And only in double king pawn openings, so everything's doubled, okay? And of course the best double is, Joe, double bills. <laughs> Terrible, okay, how could you not get that? <laughs> it was a gimme. Okay, so the first game is Paulson Morphy. And this is a famous game because, you know, Paulson made the worst I've ever seen and then Morphy gave him the smackdown. And it started with our, you know, our usual, you know, like kids opening. No. Okay, <laughs> now when, when grandmasters are black here, they play knight d4 or bishop b4. Um, but actually I learned this game a long time ago and I like what black did, so I play bishop c5 also, which is what, what Morphy did. And Castles is the best move, I agree. Castles, and knight takes e5 is the best move. Pretty good, because in the 1800s, usually it was double question mark, double question mark, and then we put them in a time machine to our chess camp, and they fit right in, <laughs> okay? Except they were way too good, okay? Well, they didn't learn the triple question mark yet, and the illegal move every move either. Okay, so uh, the point of knight takes e5, if black takes the knight, then white plays d4, the typical standard idea. And I learned this game before Spencer was born in Belgium. And I was taught rookie eight by Luc Winans, the famous Belgian grandmaster. All right, now it's time for White to start making some mistakes because he's already made about six moves. So, <laughs> and they didn't have a lot of theory then. Uh, what's the best move, Spence? Knight F3? No, 1906 was the best I don't know about that, yeah? yeah? Well, if you say so. They say Knight F3 X clam. That's what Luc Winans told me. Yeah? Right. Well, 22 years ago, I was told knight f3 was better, it's but... Like, yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, nobody plays the four knights and Nigel Short. And Nigel Short's never... Oh, wait, he was here once. Never mind. Okay, so knight c6, dc. So the purpose of the lecture today is when there's doubled pawns, people are like, double pawns? I hate when that happens. But you can get dynamic play because those pawns aren't in your way. The bishop can get out, the queen. And... Sometimes your queenside pawns go forward and start doing stuff a la Kramnik, who always has double pawns in this opening. So the bishop move, that's pretty good. Maybe bishop e2 is better? Yeah, yeah bishop c4 is a little iffy. And now b5. See those double pawns are coming in handy. A friend of mine in Michigan, a friend, he used to say triple pawns are three times as good. Okay, that's why his rating went down a lot. <laughs> All right, so bishop e2, and knight takes pawn, and we have material equality. Hooray. Knight takes, rook takes. And as usual, Morphe, that's me? I don't even have a phone. This happened all the time when Morphe was playing. It's like, turn that phone off. <laughs> Terrible. All right, and anyway, white played bishop f3, which skewers and forks and pins everything on the diagonal. Unfortunately, like many of Morphe's opponents, they like to move the same piece every move, and then they would resign with all their other pieces on the back row, which is very similar to this game. So white played bishop b5 to c4 to e2 to f3, and they'll probably move it some more just to figure out how it moves. Okay, rook e6 defends his pawn. And now you may have noticed this bishop can't move, and it's not moving. And white played a move I don't understand at all. I'm totally baffled. I thought Paulson was a good player. No, I didn't really think that. Okay, white should play d3 and then get his bishop out, but he played c3. So that's called a preparatory move where I come from. Okay, you want to prepare to make another move. When white played c3, what move did white want to play next? D4, that's why he played C3. And if white could play D4, white would have a nice position. So Morphe played queen to D3. And if I saw queen to D3, I wouldn't be playing C3, because that's terrible. What's wrong with him? So I don't know, I don't know what, if I could go ask him, I would, but. Okay, so now white's already very suspicious. Okay, B4, because that looks like what Morphe's doing. So. Bishop b6, <laughs> and a4. And if you were here for a yes or so on lecture five weeks ago, you remember the game, 
So you're gonna remember this. Morozevich Svidler. Okay, and then Morvan's pushed all his pawns and took everything. Morozevich played like A takes B and takes this, takes this, takes this, and Svidler resigned. Okay. But that didn't happen this game. Okay, so White probably wants to play a5 and win the bishop on b6, so he took. And he took with the queen to make sure his queen was out of play. <laughs> and now Morphy played bishop d7, which is a minor error. Should have played bishop to b7, and only for prophylactic reasons. Now, if you were White, you would want to kick the intruder off of d3. How could you do that? I gave you a hint by telling you what he should have done last move. How do we kick out that queen? What's that? Bishop e2. Bishop e2 is risky. Because <laughs> black would capture that. So it's risky. Well, the rook would take and the queen would stay there. So, so otherwise you'd be right. So seven, eight moves in a row and you'll kick it out. Yeah. This isn't the advanced class from yesterday, which also that would be too advanced for that. So, yeah. What? How about kicking him out in one move? See, we don't want to make it too hard for you. Can anybody attack the queen without playing bishop e2 or queen c2 giving all their pieces away? Can anyone? You want to kick this queen out. That queen's annoying. Okay, queen a6. Queen a6. That kicks out the queen on d3. And then, you know, it's equal, I guess. I don't know. You should play c4. Who should play c4? Queen c4. No, you could play c4. Then you keep your queen there. All right. <laughs> Hangs a rook, but. Yeah. Okay, so Morphy should have played bishop b7 last move, then that wouldn't have happened. But I guess Morphy knew Paulson wouldn't do that, so he didn't care. So he played rook a2. Horrible. He wants to play queen, wants to play queen c2. Right. Just wants to prepare to kick the queen out. OK. Then double the rooks. Hooray. Now, even the most dim-witted individual with an advanced degree in hyperbolic topology will tell you, black is threatening. Queen takes rook check. Right, Julian? No. Yeah. Well, he doesn't have the advanced degree yet. He's still working on it. Okay, and then mate on the back row. So white played queen a6. Why didn't he play it before? Couldn't he play queen a6 instead of rook a2? Okay, and then queen takes rook would be a 50-50 chance. Okay, queen takes queen would win. Well, it's still okay, queen, rookie, yeah, it's still okay. All right. Queen takes f3, because Morphy didn't see pawn take. Oh, wait, I've been to chess camp too long. Ugh. In my chess camp, they would just take that. OK, and then Morphy played queen takes. According to Spencer, he thought 12 minutes. Now, my understanding is uh, there was a game played in the 1800s where the guy thought 12 hours on one move. And the move was no good. That, that's not even a joke, although it sort of is. OK, so queen takes bishop, as with most of Morphy's opponents, they had excellent defense of their king. <laughs> if there was a file to, to the other side of the A file, they would go there too, further away from the king. OK, so Morphy calculated if takes, which has to be played, check, white has one legal move, bishop h3. Now we're threatening bishop g2 check and bishop f3 mate, although I would go back to h3 and then mate. <laughs> Right. Now, who can raise their hand and tell me the refutation of rook to g1? What if white plays rook to g1? Rook takes g1, and then the other rook goes to e1 with eventual mate. Right. So white didn't do that. So Julian, you defend pretty well. How would you do with white? Horrible. Well, he has a bishop for it. See, Julian's used to winning down a queen, not up a queen. Yeah. If only Preston was here. Oh, well. <laughs> Too bad. OK, so even the finest players in the room can't defend with the white pieces. Paulson played rook to d1. That way, when the checking starts, his king can run away. 
which is what happened. Check, and this king ran away. Hooray. So usually when I show this game to beginners, which would be some of you, like Joe, okay, you're like, oh, take pieces. Whenever they see an attack, they start taking pieces. Well, as somebody pointed out, possibly me, white's a queen ahead. So when you're down a queen, your goal isn't to like take a rook. Your goal is to give checkmate or win the queen back. So it would behoove you to checkmate white because then you would win. If you take the rook, you're giving you know, white a respite where he can try to defend. He wouldn't because I know him, but he could try to defend. So how would you continue attacking here? What would you do with black? Illegal. Either bishop to g7 is not check. Okay. It doesn't matter which one goes there. OK, you meant bishop g2 check, I assume. Where do you go? What? Oh, he's all the way back there. Where do you go? Bishop d2 check is fine. In fact, he may have played that. I don't remember. OK. Right, didn't he play rook g2? No. Boo. He didn't? What's wrong with him? All right, so rook g2 with the idea of takes and mate or rook takes f2, which also wins. He didn't do that. What do you do? Terrible. Who suggests? Oh, wait, that's the right move. No. <laughs> right, here. Now bishop f3, but he didn't do that either. Bishop h3. So he's, had, he's teasing him, basically. Bishop f2. All right, who can raise their hand and tell me the threat? In my camp, the answer would be nobody. <laughs> For sure. They'd be like c5, you know, <laughs> accidentally attacking the queen. Total accident. Ah, uh, bishop where? Shta? Man, I never saw anybody so weak with such a thick Russian accent. Ah, uh, terrible. Yeah. All right. So what he meant to say was, and he was kidding, bishop g2 mate with advantage. Who can stop bishop g2? Julian's already resigned a long time ago. So. Ah, who said that? <laughs> Queen takes c6. Terrible. So how do you stop bishop g2 mate? Anyone? I don't know how. What did he do? Queen f1. That's horrible. OK, queen f1. Right. All right. Takes, takes. And then rook e2. So Morphe keeps attacking, and Morphe's ahead material. Most of my students suggest that white should play rook takes a7. What's wrong with that? You. <laughs> Bishop takes a7. Right. Yeah. He's right. OK, so black, black is two pawns ahead, and black is still attacking. Uh, so that was better than just mating him, because he's making them suffer now. Okay. Rook a1, solid. Typical Morphe opponent position, rook a1. Yeah. Rook h6, putting pressure on h2. d4, finally attacking the rook. Now, if you move this bishop out of the way, then the rook is attacking, if you see what I'm saying. So where, what square should black move his bishop for maximum effect? Very good. I like it. Very good. OK. Yeah, I know you meant e3. OK, so bishop e3. He played bishop e3 because the bishop is attacking the rook, and now the bishop is not attacking the rook. And white's white? black is threatening mate in one with rook h2 or rook h2. Either one's mate. Or rook h7. So, ah, this doesn't work. Oh, he resigned. <laughs> Terrible. I like the way his pieces are all in the back rank. Typical Morphe opponent. What's wrong with those guys? Boo. Terrible. How would I do if I went back in time and played Morphe right now? Well, how would I do? A lot of draws? I'd win? Spence? A lot of draws. 10-game match, who wins? Yeah, I'll go with Morphe. I looked at Morphe's games. He won all of them. So I, I don't win all my games. Well, they look horrible when Morphe's playing them. How's Julian doing a 10-game match against Morphe Spence? What? Not as good? No. Not so good. Why do you lose every game? But, but, I, but 
but I, I, but I beat him. What? This doesn't make any sense. OK, so as is typical with Morphe's opponents, their pieces are always on the back rank. Let's look at somebody who's not Morphe, because this is getting silly. I've been looking at Morphe's games all week. His opponents aren't playing so well. OK, now, slightly different than Morphe is Rajubov Carlson, suggested by Spencer. And the third game you don't know. Ha! You don't know the third game. Rajubov, I did my own work. Rajubov Carlson, Carlson are, will be at our chess club here next month, as you all know. Do you all know that? It's published somewhere. I know other stuff, but I guess I can't tell anybody. Sorry that I know more than you, Ben. Uh, but yeah, you should come watch the event. Uh, he'll be the world champion in November. So hopefully Anand's not watching this on YouTube next week. But uh, man, Anand's just terrible. <laughs> just, just terrible. Hey, you, what if Anand went back right now and played Morphe? Like 10 years ago, he'd win. But now, draw, draw he'd be offering a draw. Who would win? No. Now you can't beat anybody. When's the last game Anon won? Come on. Never. Beat Aronian pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Morphe would do every game to Aronian. We'll ask Aronian when he's here next month. OK. So the Scotch, which is the style at the time. All right. Other than Spencer, because I'm sure he knows, and I'm guessing nobody else knows. That's my guess. Why is the Scotch popular now? <laughs> What's that? Kasparov. What did Kasparov do? And w that's right. And when did he start doing it? That's a good, that's a good right answer. What's that? The 90s. Uh, Specifically, 1990 against? Short. Ugh. Is that right? Spence? Uh, What's wrong with you guys? I thought Spencer would know. In the World Championship match, Kasparov Karpov, Kasparov said, excuse me while I whip this out and played the scotch. And Kasparov was like, what? And then he kept playing it. Everybody's like, wait, what? And I was in Novi Sad at the time. If only Sanad was here to tell me how good Novi Sad was or how terrible it is. I don't want him. He'd say one of them. I don't know which one. And we were analyzing those games, and Kasparov was getting good positions. So the Scotch was popular when Morphy was playing, and then it wasn't popular for about 80 years. Then Kasparov made it popular again. So, yes, I have an answer. Is Queen F6 reasonable here? It's a move. But if you were in my beginner class, which you should have been, then I wouldn't recommend it. In fact, we had a game in the beginner class, they can tell you, e4, e5, knight f3, queen f6. Morphe was white. Man, did he beat that guy. <laughs> that, was, that was the beatdown of all time. Yeah. Oh, I guess if you're not 2800, don't play queen f6 too early because you'll probably lose your queen. Having said that, black plate, no. OK, so bishop c5, that's what I play. Knight takes. Queen f6, yay. Now, interestingly enough, I have this position in my chess camp earlier today. So now Joe can get a little taste of what it's like to be the chess camp. He has a little taste anyway, because we told him some stuff. And white played a novelty. Bishop c4. Yeah. And he's, and he's the best player in the camp. No. And I played queen f2 mate. That was my toughest game against him, too. Well, bishop c4 is not good. Now, Rajabov, slightly better than my chess camp student, defended me. Yay. <laughs> Played queen f3. Now, before queen f3 was popular, what was the popular move here? Queen to d2. And I recommend the game Ivanchuk Nisipiano. Or was it Nisipiano Ivanchuk? Yeah, I was close. Las Vegas 99, I knew that. OK, and uh, Vonchuk hung a piece in the first 10 moves and resigned. Solid. Okay. So queen f3, and then he takes. So now we have a double king pawn opening, and we have the doubled pawns, the dreaded double pawns, before he took the other way. Different kind of doubled pawns. And again, black has compensation for his doubled pawns. One, he has an open b file. A friend of mine used to say, the more pawns you sacrifice, the more open files you have. Yay. So black has this open b file. And black is controlling the d5 square. So there's no knight to d5 coming. And maybe black will play d5. So taking pawns toward the center, doubling your pawns, that's not always bad. Queen g3, d6, saving his c7 pawn. And lots of random legal moves, as was the style at the time. <laughs> 
and, ho and black is hoping that white takes and he'll take back and he'll have the diamond pawn chain soon. Okay, Carlson's best friend, the diamond pawn chain. <laughs> and everybody has doubled pawns. But black's double pawns seem better because they control the center more. I don't know about this H2, G3 stuff. And the knight on A4 is a bit suspicious. And so he eventually takes the bishop, which is not something I would have wanted to do. But OK, A2 is hanging, and two bishops is two bishops. And now we can see those pawns are quite nice. Now in my chess camp last week, whenever a certain player had double pawns because of you know, capturing, he three or four moves, he's like, wait, what's going on? He assumed like he set the board up wrong. Because he, and he was like, he wanted to always go back, and I'm like, no, 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 this actually happened. He'd keep, keep playing. Yeah, he's well. Usually he was right when, yeah. Usually the board was set up wrong, but that's not the point. So when he had double pawns, he was like, how'd that happen? And I'm like, you capture something with a pawn. He's like, what? And I'm like, you did it. Like, don't you remember doing it? You do it every game. Okay. So, so double pawns in this case are good because they're together. The rook is open. These double pawns, eh, not, so, not so much. Now, usually when I show a class full of intermediate players a position like this, they're very worried that black isn't castling. Why didn't black castle every move? Why isn't he castling now? Well, castling in the opening is good, but since there's a lot of pieces traded, <clears throat> there's no reason to castle. So you probably castle now. <laughs> um, in fact, there was an end game played in in one of the super tournaments in the 80s, and somebody castled in this position, similar, and Bavinik said, what is he doing? His king belongs in the center, terrible. And I mean, I'm like, that guy's 2,800. But, but yeah, Bavinik didn't like that. He always said in the end game, you gotta move your king in the center. So, did he castle? Ah, king e7. He did what I said. F3, knight e5. So I think Rajabov thought this was gonna be a draw, because this looks pretty boring. Again, he took to, with the F pawn, because now his pawns are even more together. Now he can really push his pawns up, which he ends up doing. And white's pawns aren't really good for advancing. They're just going to sit still. Again, it sort of looks like a draw. White can just sit tight. But Carlson is the master of winning with no advantage. And nothing happens for a long time. If you saw the Blair Witch Project, you're used to this. Nothing's happening, nothing's happening. Okay. And he decides to play on the queen side with his king, move his king up, move his pawns up. And because he has double pawns, he has more C pawns to move and gain more space. But he's not in a hurry. Now he can go back to the king side. <laughs> not in any big hurry. And yeah, it's funny, his double pawns were traded and he kept pushing and pushing and pushing and now he has an advantage. It's a still be a draw, but this was at a time in Rajabov's life when he decided losing every game was a good idea. <laughs> and Rajabov went from third or fourth in the world to like, you know, my rating. Terrible. Although slightly better than me. How would Rajabov do against Morphe? Ugh, oh, terrible. F takes G4, question mark. More bad moves. <laughs> and as you can see, yeah, these pawns that were doubled became quite good. Now, what player in the 1960s liked to have those double pawns all the time and eventually push them up the board as we saw in this game? Anyone? 60s. Early 70s? Fisher, Fisher terrible. Yeah, Fisher was all right. Tall, no, Tall sacrificed all his pieces. <laughs> Who was famous for doubled pawns and then he would advance them up and win and see how great he was? He liked to see how great he was, too. Play, he, played, he played on the boards ahead of Fisher. Uh, Larson. Bent Larson. <laughs> right. And in fact, Bent Larson and the Carol Khan likes to destroy his own pawn structure to get these kind of positions. Okay. And of course, Rajabov, terrible. So. And then, see all those variations? Those are exciting. <laughs> and now, like most of you, White resigned. <laughs> they actually gave a variation that made no sense. I like that. G4, which I would never consider. <laughs> That's the variation. 
Yeah, it looks good for black. Yeah. Okay, then they gave up. They're like, all right, black wins. So uh, if we go back, the pawn structure that started out in the opening, this is the quickest way to go back. Now, Spencer's like, what? What are you doing? The, the pawn structure we saw in the opening, it looks like black had no dynamic chances. It looks like sort of boring here. Uh, but then, after knight takes b6, which I don't know why he did that, now black, black has more pawns together. And after bishop takes e5, it was the same thing. And now, well, we can see those pawns will get stronger and stronger. And he just has a big pawn majority against white's pawns that just can't move. So very nice game. But more importantly, the, 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 the purpose of this game, the last game and the next one, is to show that double pawns aren't always bad. They can control a lot of squares. Pawns can come together if your opponent lets you. Don't get knight takes b6. And uh, they can become very strong. And what's more important is that they don't become weak. Like in this position, OK, these pawns are doubled. This pawn is isolated. But there's no easy way or even any way that white's going to capture those pawns. Sometimes doubled pawns and isolated pawns are weak, and they can get captured. But here, they're very safe. There's no way to capture them. And eventually, since they're doubled, they're actually closer together. They can move up the board. And Rajabov's no good, and Carlson's great. <laughs> Main thing I wanted you to learn. OK, and the next game is the most important, because Spencer's never seen it before. Smates Sokolov. And of course, Smates lost because he beat me last year, so I'm getting my revenge. It's my class. Okay, Jan Smates is one of the top 10 players in Holland. Some would say the top five. I'm not sure, actually. If only Yasser was here, I'll ask Yasser what he thinks. And I played Smates last year in Al Ain in the UAE, and he was the only player to beat me. Uh, this game was played in 2002 when he was only 2,300 feet A, and his opponent's Ivan Sokolov. And for those of you who follow chess, Ivan Sokolov um, a year and two months ago won the World Open, right? Yeah. yeah. And well, Ivan Sokolov has been one of the top 20, 30, 40 players in the world for a while, but not for a while. But he used to be. 2000s, 90s. No? It's pretty good. And uh, Sokolov is from some Yugoslavian country like Yugoslavia. I don't know. One of those. And, and uh, he moved to the Netherlands about 20 years ago. So he plays for the Netherlands. Which one is he from? Do you know Spence? Yeah. Dutch now. I don't think he was Bosnian. I think uh, Nikolic was Bosnian. Maybe he still is. OK, so we see another Scotch. Looks familiar. And now queen to d2. And this game was played in. 2002, and that was the most popular move then. If you were paying attention, and you probably weren't, white played queen f3 the last game. Queen d2, and he takes getting the same kind of pawn structure. Knight c3, queen g6. Queen g6 is designed to do several things. We don't want the bishop to move, because we'll take. And we want our knight to go to f6 instead of e7. Knight e7, knight g6 is what I usually do, but I usually lose. So, OK, and some of you were probably wondering why white's queen is at d2, because that looks sort of silly. Well, unlike my chess camp opponent today, he stopped main on f2. So that's <laughs> better than most. But yeah, usually you play stuff like queen f4, queen g5. But OK, he played f4, which is a little loose. Now, if you want to castle kingside, usually you do, and your opponent's bishop is on c5, I don't recommend playing f4. Then you're not going to castle kingside. OK, knight e7. Knight f6 is the normal move. And d5. This is the idea. So well, black's playing very actively using his doubled pawns, because it's defended. And he's taking advantage of the fact that white cannot castle kingside, because it's illegal which wouldn't stop at least half the kids in my camp, at least. 
and it can't cancel a queen side because he sort of blocked himself off. So even though white might win a pawn or even two pawns, black is going to castle, black's going to be quicker developed, and Sokolov is going to attack the king on e1. And the fact that black has double pawns actually helps him because he has more control of the center. If that pawn was on b7 instead of c6, d5 would not be playable. And he played e5 question mark because, you know, he's Dutch. So. Where's Ben Conover? Yeah. All right, so, well, the main idea, these other variations don't matter. This is the variation that matters. E takes d5. Everybody in this room was screaming e takes d5. Keep it down, people. Okay, e takes d5, threatening the queen and taking a pawn. You've only dreamed about making such a move. <laughs> but black plays bishop f5, and I don't want to have white here, because the center's completely open, and white's going to castle, white? black's going to castle king side, and then play rook to e8, and black has a lead in development. This is like Jan Smates versus Morphy, right? <laughs> black's getting all his pieces out, and you know, white's floundering around. What kind of move is f4? What's wrong with him? He played f4, and I couldn't beat him? Right. Okay, so the correct move is knight to a4, attacking the bishop but he played e5, and you can all guess black's next move. Bishop f5. It's a good thing he played it, because I would have looked silly. Knight a4 now, bishop to d4. So yeah, white's position looks a little strange. And the trick is you can't play c3, because your bishop is hanging on d3. So he takes and plays queen e2, so his bishop on c1 can get out. Now, a lot of times in positions like this, the right thing for black to do is super, super aggressive because white can't castle, white's knight is on a4, and you want to punish white right away. And sometimes that's the right idea. But with the king on e8, I would be a little weary, a little leery of that, and weary. h5, typical Sokolov move, stopping g4 and possibly playing h4 later, and securing the knight on f5. Positionally, this is already too good for black. The, the knight's on f5, and there's no white squared bishop. There's nothing that can kick it out. It just sits there forever. And the bishop on d4 is pretty good, too. Bishop d2, he's finally going to castle. a5, ready for castling, which is what happened. Castles. And rook h e1, which was given dubious, because he put a rook in the center. Why would you do that? <laughs> rook e8, queen to d3, c5. And again, just like in the Carlson game, which was an end game, Sokolov is using his double pawns to his advantage. Going to push his c pawn, then I'll push his other c pawn, and because white castled queen side, because he can't castle king side, black has this ready made open b file because he had to make the double pawns. So, well, I don't say get double pawns every move now, and, but you can see how they could be advantageous in some positions. Ben Larson would agree if he didn't go 0 and 9 in his last tournament, but that's what happens. True, true story. C4 question mark, pushing pawns in front of his own king. Now, if you were listening to the lecture earlier, and some of you were, what did my stupid, I mean, what did my friend in Michigan say about this position? Triple pawns are three times, are three times as good. Bam, D takes C4. Okay, so black wants to open the position up because that's where white's king is. So his pawn structure is not great, but he has a lot of open files, and he has a lot of activity. If this c5 pawn wasn't here, that bishop wouldn't be so solid. Queen c2, question mark, typical smates, terrible. Queen e6, king b1, rook b8. Man, I'm waiting for rook b4. Hope he played rook b4 at some point. Ah, oh, he just played queen d7, terrible. E6, getting counterplay. It's not really any counterplay. Bishop C3. 
bishop takes c3. And we have a knight that can replace the bishop. Yeah, knight d4, yeah. Those triple pawns are pretty good. They control a lot of squares. And it gives black the open d and the open b file. And, uh, well, I have to quote my good friend Gregory Kaidenov. He's my good friend because I beat him last year in the US Championship. But, uh, well, he drew me this year. Uh, Gregory and I used to work together, and he wrote a nice article in Chess Life. He was interviewed a few, about a year ago. And he said when he went to chess camp, and he was teaching kids who were actually high rated, they were like, ah, doubled pawns, isolated pawns, terrible. And Kaidenov said, that doesn't matter. He says what matters is peace activity. And Kaidenov would like this game, because black has a lot of peace activity, but don't look at his pawn structure. On the other hand, black has a lot of extra pawns. So. But Kaidenov says peace activity is much more important than pawn structure. So when you do have a bad pawn structure, doubled pawns, isolated pawns, if you can compensate by using the open files that they afford, then you have a good position. Obviously, this knight is better than this knight, and black has a big attack on the king, notwithstanding his tripled pawns and isolated pawns. Rook f1, c3, the arrow tells it all. Rook takes c3, knight b3. This looks like somebody who plays Morphe versus Morphe. That's what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're threatening rook takes queen and knight to d2 check. Man, rook f1 was a good move. This guy, this guy crushed me, this guy who's white. Rook d3. What would you play if you were black? Knight d2 check. Knight d2 check. I don't know what he played. Oh, well, hey, yay. Hey. That's like some x-ray. King c1. Can I play rook takes queen, and then if rook takes queen, knight takes rook? Not bad. Hey, I was right. <laughs> All right, and he resigned. Terrible. Yeah, normally when the B file is open after BC, you don't try to castle a queen side because you get crushed. And when he played F4, he couldn't castle a king side. The most important move in that game was, well, I'm going back, who remembers? What was the most important move? I mean, for black. B takes C. <laughs> Terrible. Still learn nothing. D5. D5, yeah. That uses the double pawns, and it shows that F4 was no good that he's willing to sacrifice a pawn to open the lines up and keep this king here. It was very similar to Morphe games. Black's going to castle and white's not. So that just proves Morphe would have crushed the Grandmasters today. That proves it. So one game's all I needed. You know, the guy, the guy who was before he was a Grandmaster. And, and I am serious, and so is Joe. Yeah, man, he would, he would crush those guys. Yeah, Morphe was good. He actually calculated accurately. Guys today, you know, miss everything. If you want to see inaccurate calculation, other than looking at your own games, look at the British Championship. That'll, that'll hook you up. Now, I, I was complaining on Facebook, it's my usual rant, that the British Championship is a mockery of a sham of a travesty. Okay, if you saw the movie Bananas, you'll get that joke. And uh, this guy's like, what do you mean? And I'm like, the top players aren't playing, and there's 1,900 players playing. It's the British Championship. And they're like, well, Britain's not so good. I'm like, yeah, it is. Just shorts, not, what? Yeah, go to, the, go to the internets if you know how. And look at the British Championship. 1,900 players, 2,000 players are playing. And there's no short. There's no McShane. Although when McShane was losing all of his games, I called him McShane. But Howell's, the, 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 Howell's playing. Howell's, Howell's winning all his games because he sees who's playing in the tournament. Right, the guy the class has never heard of is winning all his games. Howell's not good. No, he didn't. I don't even believe, even if it did, I don't believe it. No, nah, Howell's terrible. I hope you're watching this, Howell, because you're, you're awful. Okay, first of all, Howell drew Bill Couch in the Chicago Open, and he was completely lost. And he was completely lost. He's lucky to draw. Right. Anyway, this is what happens when you don't have sponsors or people who have a lot of interest. The top players in the country aren't playing, and they let everybody play. So, I mean, who wants to watch that? But if you want to see a lot of blunders, now you're, now you're good. Watch the British Championship, and every game is ridiculous. 
And there's a lot of seven or eight move draws. Because the grandmasters want to play the 1900 players when they play each other the nine move draw. Okay, US Championship, you, you know, you just lose. Like there's, no, there's nobody easy to play. Straplinski last place. True story. Yeah. So uh, earlier I was mentioning Bent Larson. That's a good way of doing it, by the way. I was mentioning Bent Larson. As most of you know, and I mean, I say most, I mean at least one of you knows, that one of the most famous variations named after Larson was a very similar opening to what we just looked at, but his other way around English. Right, and then after takes, which way did Larson take? G takes F, right. So some of you might think that looks a little iffy, but it's called the Larson, who else was the other guy? Bronstein Larson. Yeah, Bronstein's another suspicious character. So, uh, so yeah, GF, Black's position looks really iffy, but Bronstein and Larson said, yay, this is good for Black. I control the center. My pawns are going to the center. Okay, now my favorite trap is this one. Take this way, that's more my style, solid. Okay, and many of my grandmaster opponents fall for the, no, it's never happened. Bishop C4, Queen E7 check. Raise your hand and suggest a move for white. Hopefully a bad one. There you go. Knight E2 losing and Bishop E3 losing for the same reason. Bam. Actually, grandmasters have fallen into that. Now, if you were watching the 10-minute tournament at the National Open this year, which I was standing there watching it, or you could watch it on Monroy, uh, this was the game, not this, but very similar, uh, Ray Robson, a Kobian. It was a Carol Kahn, and <laughs> Kobian played queen b4 check, winning the bishop on c4 on move 11 or 12, and Robson's like, oh. oh so that's, uh, yeah, I hate when that happens. Yeah, it wasn't that position, but it was cl almost that position. And Robson was already a piece down. He sacked a piece for an attack. So he's down two pieces. That's uh, not good. Right, so these double pawns, they give you extra space. With the pawn being here, it's not here. So you can play queen e7. And when you play gf, the favorite of Larson, if only Yasser was here, I could tell you a great Yasser game that he played. 1988 against Gipsless, right? And then Yasser won with like 25 moves of black. But White Castle's king side, then the rook comes here and you made him because there's no g pawn. Now those are, those are you know, the best case scenarios, but double pawns and isolated pawns aren't always bad. There's dynamic play. And that's what players like Larson were looking for and players like Bronstein. Mm -hmm.